Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Um, I would like to go over some of the information that's been coming out about the um, Idaho University students that were killed and just kind of discuss everything with you. So there's been a little bit of information coming from different places. So we will start first with an article and then I have multiple videos, but I'm only gonna show segments of the video. But um, it says that the coroner Idaho students were stabbed to death in their beds. And I do have the segment to show you of that where she said it, but um, yeah. So it basically says that uh, four University Idaho students who were found dead in a rental house last Sunday were stabbed to death in their beds and likely were asleep when the attacks occurred, the coroner told the cable news channel on Friday. Um, and it also stated that each victim suffered multiple stab wounds from a pretty large knife. It has to be somebody pretty angry in order to stab four people to death. And then efforts to reach out to the coroner um, didn't result in anything uh, for for response. So, um, but yeah, so that was the or original write up, right? But I have the actual um, part where they said that. And so I'm gonna bring you to that if I can uh, grab it really quick for you. So let me add you over here onto this and you can actually hear the coroner say it. And it comes from News Nation. Um, she was actually on with Banfield. You know, it was late at night or early in the morning. So um, it seems likely that maybe they were sleeping. Were they found in separate areas of the house? Um, that hasn't been disclosed yet. Uh, can you tell me when you say that they might have been sleeping, were they found in beds? Um, yes. And so can you tell me if there were multiple stab wounds per victim or were these sort of, you know, individual lethal uh, stab wounds that may have been um, less in number, but more in, in uh, lethality? Um, there were multiple stab wounds, um, yes, on, on them. So, and- Were there, go ahead. And most of them had just like one that was the lethal uh, stab wound, yes. Can you describe what that one might have been? Um, but they were to um, the fatal ones were to the chest area or the upper body area. Were there? Um, and I only ask this because it sometimes determines what kind of a, a crime this was—a crime of passion, a, a random crime, a, a fight, a struggle. Was there? Uh, were any of them uh, slashed? Were, were any of their necks cut? Um, or were these all? Puncture wounds. Well, it was a pretty large knife, so it's really hard to call them puncture wounds. And they were definitely stabbings. And um, I mean, it has to be somebody that's pretty angry in order to stab four people to death. So that was kind of a lot, right? I know that it's um, kind of hard to hear, but um, yeah, it's just, it's really terrible. It's really, really terrible. Uh, so, I mean, she revealed quite a bit and it kind of makes me wonder if she was supposed to reveal that much exactly. Like, I don't know that the police would have wanted her to reveal that they were in their beds, right? Uh, I don't know about that. I really don't. Um, I'm not sure about that. Kind of concerns me a little bit. But then you also have family members that are also revealing information. And uh, like one of them, a family member um, stated and I don't want to say the wrong one right now, so I'm not going to just throw one out there, but stated that the daughter, I mean, I think I know which one, but I'm not going to say uh, the wrong one, stated that 
she had defensive wounds on her arms, on her hands and her arms, and that she fought off the the person um, or attempted to fight. And so, again, I don't know. I mean, there's a reason the coroner said that she couldn't speak to the defensive wounds. So was the family not supposed to say, right? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but that's really sad. It's really sad because, I mean, typically with these, we know what's not the same as a gun. It's not going to be quick and fast and done and over. And so likely they all did get woke up. They typically would have probably woke up to it happening. Um, it's sad. It's so, it's so awful. This is uh, Kaylee's sister. And this is a little bit more information that, again, I don't know um, if the police wanted out there. I don't know. Uh, maybe they did get the pass to go ahead and say some of this stuff. I don't really know. But there's, like, a lot of information coming out. But it's all coming from different areas. And it's, like, a little bit here and a little bit there, right? And so I'll try to piece a little bit of this together for you. Gonzalez isn't waiting for police. She's tracking down her own leads to find her sister Kaylee's killer. We're not getting any answers and we're not going to settle for that. Hi. It was Olivia who found the potentially crucial video of her sister and Madison Mogan at a food truck just hours before they were murdered. She also tracked down their Uber driver. I found neighbors ring camera footage so that I can verify that the Uber driver took her home. She's also raising questions about why her sister called a young man named Jack multiple times the night she was slain. At 2.26 a.m., Kaylee starts to call Jack. Kaylee calls Jack six times between 2.26 a.m. to 2.44 a.m. Gosh, I, I give you a lot of credit. You're, you're, you're almost like a detective here, putting all the pieces together. I spoke with retired detective Phil Waters, who had a 96% clearance rate on homicide cases when he was with the Houston police. There's no doubt that this is a person who is filled with a type of evil that is incomprehensible. There were two other roommates in the house who walked away from this. How is that possible? The use of an edge weapon is going to prevent any kind of real sounds that would awaken the other two girls. If this person, and it appears to be they are, proficient with an edge weapon, the deaths would have occurred so quickly that there would have been no opportunity for them to cry out. How awful is that? Oh, oh, that's so sad. Oh, that makes me so sad. Um, but yeah, as, as the sister said, I wanted to really touch on the fact that the statement that the, that Kaylee had called Jack, Jack, if he is her, her boyfriend slash maybe ex-boyfriend, right? I don't know. It goes back and forth. So I really don't know whether they were together still or if they had were together but were having an issue or were on and off again I'm not sure I just know that they had dated and had been together at one point in time and it's kind of concerning because there are people that are showing you know that he does appear to look similar to the man in the footage right from the food truck that he does have the same shoes as the guy from the food truck and um, similar wardrobes at times and, and whatnot. And so, I don't know, it's it's concerning. I do know that um, it was one of the, I think it might've been actually the sister, but it was one of the sisters that pointed out that, yeah, it was her, that also pointed out one of the guys, they said one of the men in the background, I would assume probably that man, if I were to guess. Now they said that, with the police, he is uh, cooperating. But just because you're cooperating doesn't mean you haven't done anything, technically. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I, uh, I, I'm I not saying that he did, right? Don't get me wrong on that. Um, just letting you guys know that um, there did seem to be something happening there. And that maybe he wasn't some creepy, you know, maybe it was just the boyfriend and maybe they, she was doing the girls thing and kind of leaving him in the back, you know, leaving him in the dust, or um, maybe they had been argued, or I, I don't know. I'm not really sure. It's so confusing, you guys. I really have no idea. 
I'm just as lost as all of you. Uh, also, um, another father had talked during an interview and he had stated that, um, okay, so this is the one that they stated that, um, that the daughter was strong-willed woman who fought her killer to the very end with bruises and was torn by the knife and um, she's a tough kid and then said that the door locks with a number code and every time you go in you have to go around the house because the number code um, so they either knew that or went around and maybe found at the sliding glass door which I've now heard reports claiming that supposedly it said they did definitely use the sliding glass door the person that did this went in the sliding glass i didn't hear the police definitely confirm that did did you am i losing like i don't there's so much information coming out i'm like unsure who is making these statements right i'm trying to keep it all straight but um yeah so either way i want to play you guys another video so let me take you over to that and i'll show you this one really quick and this is only part of it but uh i'll play it for you right now still no suspects adrian and good morning to you the coroner says these four students were found in their beds stabbed multiple times the university sent out a note late last night saying police maintained this was a targeted attack but with no one in custody and little information the families of the victims are demanding answers this morning, a killer is still on the run following the gruesome stabbings of four University of Idaho students, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, Zaina Kernodal, and Kaylee Gonzalez. Kaylee's sister, Olivia Gonzalez, spoke with News Nation's Chris Cuomo Thursday night, saying her sister was a go-getter and an absolute fighter. They had no idea why she was the target of such a brutal slaying. There's nothing. There's no boy problem. There's no threat. There's no um, high risk lifestyle. Olivia says she provided police with this video of her sister at a food truck in the hour before she died and identified one of the men in the background who she says is cooperating with police. See, that was the part right there. So she's the one that provided them with it and identified one of the men in the background. They didn't say which man, but I. It makes you wonder, right, if it's that man and he's cooperating with the police because we have heard that supposedly that guy was cooperating with the police. So it makes you put like two and two together. It's very strange. It's very strange. There's just a lot of pieces of information coming out and we're just trying to piece it all together at this point I, to try to make sense of it. Police say Kaylee and Madison were at a downtown bar, while Ethan and Zaina were at a party before they all came home to their off-campus apartment early Sunday morning and were attacked sometime around 2 or 3. The 911 call for an unconscious person came in at noon. Police say two other roommates were inside the apartment home at the time unharmed. I do know who they were. I have not spoken to them. Um, they were my sister's roommates. Obviously, I know who she lived with. Olivia hopes someone will come forward so she can get her sister and her friends justice. We're losing critical time and I want more coverage. I want more done. I understand that we can't really Yeah, the, I want critical time or uh, we're losing critical time. There, There's actually another video um another woman that's going to be talking here in another video that talks about the loss of critical time and that they completely agree with what she said right that this is really important right now so let me put you on her really quickly and then i'm going to take you to the video that shows you the maps of like where everybody was in the time frame but I want to talk about also something that one of the victim's sisters just told Chris Cuomo last night. She's right. They are losing critical time. Here's the problem. People in that town are frightened. They're scared and they're all going home. And that poses a real problem for investigators. They need to be canvassing and interviewing everybody at that mm -hmm. bar last night, that, that night where two of the victims were and at that party where the other two victims were. Every single one of those people needs to be interviewed. And now many of these people are going home for the holidays early because they're so frightened. Yeah, and those who remain in the community 
uh, officials have now said the killer could be a further danger to the public, but how can they be vigilant without more information? Well, that's, you know, listen, it's a fine line police have to walk in these kinds of situations. They don't, they want to keep information that only the killer would know private because that will help them when they, when they, when it comes to prosecuting this person and arresting this person. But they should never have said that the community at large is not at danger. Somebody in the community brutally murdered four people um, and is out walking around. That inherently puts the entire community at risk. They do keep saying this was a targeted attack, but there are all sorts of critical questions. How did one person stab to death four people? Um, were there more than one attacker in this case? Because it is extremely unusual that one person could overpower four people. We've already heard um, one of the family members say that they were told by police police that their loved one did fight back, that there were signs of a struggle. Of course there were. This is not um, murder with a gun, for example, where you can incapacitate somebody very, very quickly. Stabbing someone to death is a brutal, up-close, intimate way to murder somebody. It usually shows a great deal of anger and passion, and to do it four times in one house in one night is extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. So this woman gives a lot of, like, good insight, for sure. I mean, um, it, it just goes to show that y they never should have said that the community wasn't in danger at all, right? I'm shocked that they made that statement. They could have at least better explained it, right? If they were going to say that we don't think that others are at risk uh, because we feel that it's targeted, but right. But then also it's really concerning because people are leaving, they are going home, and now police aren't able to interview every single person that would have been out at the bar or out out with where the girls or the couple were and so you're not going to get all the interviews so they're saying that this is going to be prolonged even longer the process is going to be even longer to get to a conclusion likely because of not being able to interview everybody and re-interview people after that and then what if there's people that unenroll, right? Because they are so afraid that they make the decision they don't want to go back again because they're they're so concerned. What if the person that's responsible also unenrolls, right? But they just use the, oh, well, I don't feel safe. I'm scared. I don't want to go back to the community. I don't want to go back to the college. I, I, I'm fearful, right? And then they don't even come back to begin to begin with they never return back. It's just really scary. Um, I'm going to add all of this into the description. So if you want to watch the rest of what she says, which is it's insightful, um, you can find it there in the description so that you can just click right on it and be able to watch her. And then I'm also going to play you this one because this talks about the, it shows the map and talks about the timeline. Welcome to the news at noon. I'm Brenda Rodriguez. The Moscow community wants answers after four University of Idaho students were found dead in a house near campus on Sunday afternoon. The Leda County coroner says Ethan Chapin, Zena Cornodal, uh, Madison Mogan, and Kylie Concavez were all stabbed to death, and their deaths have all officially been ruled homicide murder. Our Abby Davis is live in Moscow. Abby, what have you learned today? Well, Brenda, you can see behind me the crime scene is pretty active right now. You guys can see that crime scene tape blocking off the entrance. There are a good amount of law enforcement here right now. We know there's a forensic team that is also still collecting evidence. But right now, there's really more questions than answers with so many unknown factors, especially with the killer still out there now. The Latah County coroner, Kathy Mabbitt, told KTVB today some of the victims were in bed when they were stabbed, but can't say which ones. She also says it's likely they were asleep, but can't specify who. Mabbitt said she has no way of knowing if the same knife was used on all four victims. It was definitely a knife. It would seem like if there was more than one, it was very similar, not just the same one for all of them. She also cannot speak to defensive wounds and can't specify an exact time of death because it was reported many hours later. Now here's what we know about the timeline. Idaho State Police actually just released a map of events this morning. So this is brand new information that we have for you guys. Look at the top of your screen on Saturday. Kaylee and Maddie were seen at the Corner Club on Main Street between 10 p.m. and 1.30 a.m. 
Ethan and Zanna were at a Sigma Chi party near the home between 8 and 9 p.m. Now on Sunday, so after leaving the Corner Club, Kaylee and Maddie were at Grub Truck at 1.40 a.m., which we have video of, and Etha and Zanna and Kaylee and Maddie, so all four of them, they were all back to the house at 1.45 a.m. So that is what we know about the timeline right now. It wasn't until noon that same day when officers responded to a 911 call about an unconscious person when they got to the house off King and Queen Road near U of I's campus, they found the four students dead. Fry said, or Moscow Police Chief James Fry said there was no sign of forced entry. He also said two roommates were home when it happened, but didn't go so far as to call them witnesses and says they were not hurt. Now, investigators, like I mentioned before, with the forensics team, they are still collecting evidence at the scene. Just to reiterate, they don't have a suspect or suspects at this time or a description. Fry maintained that this is an isolated attack. But he says he cannot say there is no threat to the community. So they're asking people to stay vigilant, be careful. And they're also, they're also asking anybody who knows anything to call their tip line. We have that number right here. It's 208-883-7180, 208-883-7180. So Brenda, just lots of questions at this time still. Yeah. yeah. So that's the most of the date was that them putting out the map. I have put the map on my community wall for you. So you can take a look at it there as well. I will put it over on my Facebook if that's easier for you to grab it, if you wanted to get a hold of it. And uh, you can take a better look at it that way. But yeah, so they put out the map and uh, they still are looking for any tips that they could possibly get from anybody. And they put out the the times of, you know, where every single one of them were. And so um, hopefully it helps and hopefully people are calling and giving tips. But um continue to pray for all their families and the community, everybody involved. I'll keep you guys posted and updated on anything else that comes out. I'll talk to you very, very soon. Bye everyone.